are you? Everyone doing well? It is good to be together. Feel free to stretch out a little bit, get that elbow room. Uh, one of the things we didn't want to do is uh, put you back in the Generation Center in those uncomfortable plastic seats, because we have graduated from the uncomfortable plastic seats. Yes, and you're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome. I want to thank you so much for being here this morning. Um, I'll tell you, I know that this is going to be a little bit more leadership content. There will be a Q&A with Pastors Rick and Cindy. Can we give them a hand for being here with us today? I'm excited. We have a full, full weekend with them. Uh, you're not going to want to miss any of tomorrow, any of the experiences, because rumor has it we're going to have a double header, potentially different content, and you're the only one that knows. Uh, we have not promoted that elsewhere, but uh, that's the benefit of being here on a Saturday morning with us. Um, we had an amazing time with Pastors Rick and Cindy. For those that don't know, they, uh, they lead this amazing church called Summit Christian Center in San Antonio, Texas. Um, and what they have done, their life, their ministry, it speaks for itself. If you Google Rick, you're going to see a lot of stuff. But uh, what I'll tell you is, I, I, I'll tell you, Pastor Rick, I, I normally have to tell everybody, Pastor Rick, I, I I call this Rick unfiltered, but the reality is Pastor Rick doesn't have a filter. This is Pastor Rick. I only have to tell you that so that you're ready to hear the absolute truth, nothing but the truth, so help him God. Yes? And so, uh, again, I'm so excited that you are here with us, but I want to give him every moment, every second. I just want to remind you the index card you should have received on your way in is for the Q&A that we will have in the second session. So, um, go ahead and write those down as they come. They probably will come, and I promise you, you're going to get a straightforward answer this morning. Is that good? Come on, let's give some love to Pastor Rick as he comes and encourages us. Turned on. Okay. While this while it is leadership, I'll guarantee you there are two points I'm gonna make that will change your life forever. I will tell you it is not taught in school, it is not taught in seminary, and it is not taught in churches, and 90% of pastors or leaders have no clue even about it. It is liberating. Truth doesn't bind. Truth makes you free. And that is something I absolutely cherish. So I hope I can make you miserable and free <laughs> with some things I'm going to say in a few minutes. Now, my first, the first two points are going to be, yeah, I believe that. Then we go into the areas that are not taught, not understood, and everybody, parents, single people, religious people, uh, ministers, uh, civic leaders, can finally go, oh, I never thought of that, and it sets you free. So it should be taught. It isn't taught. So I'm going to do my best to give you a brief synopsis, okay? Romans 13 verse 1 says, Let every soul be subject to the higher authorities, for there's no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So his subject, the Apostle Paul's subject here is higher authorities, meaning there are levels of, of authority. There's not just one authority. There are different stratas of authority. And God says, I want you to submit to the higher authority. So I want to show you like seven levels of authority. Here's the first one. Very simple. Sovereign authority. Sovereign authority for a believer is the authority that's always right, never wrong, and you never challenge it. If it says jump, you say how high? It is never challenged. It is never questioned. So who has that? For the believer, only Jesus Christ holds the position of sovereign authority. No pope, no CEO, no apostle, no bishop, no prophet has sovereign, unquestioned, unchallenged, always right authority. Because no one except Jesus is always right and are unchallenged. Okay, so far? Sovereign authority. Listen to Ephesians 1. Verse 20 and 22, he worked 
with that same power in Christ when he brought him back to life and gave him the highest position in heaven. Jesus is above all rulers, all authorities, all powers, all lords, and all other names that can be named, not only in this present world, but in the world to come. God has put everything under the control of Christ. He has made Christ the head of everything for the good of the church. So any man that tries to take the position equal to Christ in the church as sovereign authority is lawless and disobedient. No human man has unchallenged authority and is always right. Philippians 2 verse 9 this is easy, so I'm going quickly here. This is not the fun part. All right. It says, therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. Uh, Revelation 19, 16, he's king of kings and lord of lords. So if you're a king, he's king over you. If you're a lord, he's lord over you. Yeah. Satan tried to exalt himself to the position of sovereign authority. You remember that. In Isaiah 14, he said, I will ascend to heaven. I will set my throne above God's stars. I will climb to the highest heaven and be like the most high. So here an archangel tries to assist himself and lift himself to sovereign authority like God. And God threw him out of heaven with a third of the angels who rejected him. So again, no human being on earth has sovereign authority. No one. Number two is the authority of truth. The authority of truth. I call it voracious authority. Anything that is true has authority by virtue of the fact it's true. Two plus two equals four. A hundred million years from now, two plus two will always be four. So it has authority by virtue of the fact it's true. In 1 John 5, the Holy Spirit is called the spirit of truth. So the Holy Spirit did something for man by bringing him something so he could know what truth is. The Holy Spirit brought the scriptures, God's word. In 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So in John 17, 17, he says, your word, O God, is truth. And one more, Isaiah 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they don't speak according to this word, it is because there is no truth in them. So for a believer, the word of God holds the position of voracious authority, the authority of truth. Scripture is what a believer uses to assess and verify and judge everything. How does that stack up with God's word? We live in an ever-changing culture. We live in a changing morality. We change in so many things that I never thought I'd live to see. So how do I judge and assess anything as a believer? By God's word. If it, uh, let me give you a quick synopsis. 200 years ago, in an ecclesiastical conference, the Westminster Confession, this was brought about because of rampant heresy in the church. So to combat it, they held the Westminster Confessions, and they've been the guidelines for the church in governing itself for the past, what, several hundred years. Now, Satan hates God's word. The first words out of Satan's mouth that are ever recorded in Scripture are, hath God said. The very first book of the Bible, his first words recorded were, oh, God doesn't mean that. Now, surely God is not old-fashioned. Surely, surely. He told Eve, God doesn't mean what God says. Well, that hasn't stopped, and that's always been the case. So if I know that he hates this so bad, it's because it's true, it's eternal, and God's word doesn't change. Uh, culture changes, laws change, but God says heaven and earth will pass away, my word shall never pass away, not one jot, not one tittle. So here, were, here are the three articles, the first three articles of the Westminster Confession. Number one, nothing contrary to Scripture 
can ever be true. So if anything contradicts clear scripture, it can't be true ever. Okay. Why? Because God's word didn't change. Okay. That's a guideline for me. Number two, nothing in addition to scripture can ever be binding, but it might be true, but you can't bind people with it. If it's in addition, it could be historically true, but it's not in the Bible. It could be reasonably true, uh, speculative truth. It could be true, but you can't bind people to it. So nothing in addition to Scripture can ever be binding on you. And third, every believer is responsible to God to search the Scriptures and see if what's being preached is true. That's your responsibility. See, let me give you an example. Acts chapter 17, Paul and Silas, who are apostles, are preaching to the Berean believers, okay? But the, the Bereans were not impressed with their title or their anointing. Instead, in verse 11, it says, the Bereans searched the scriptures daily to find out whether what was being preached was true. So, were they rebuked for searching scripture to check out the apostles? Nope, they were commended. Paul said, if an apostle or even an angel preaches anything contrary to Scripture, let him be accursed, Galatians 1, verse 8. So for the believer, everything has to be judged by God's Word, and that is still God's formula for every believer in Christ. No human being, no apostle, no pastor, no priest, no pope, no prophet, no CEO has the legal right to violate God's word. So scripture, thanks bro, scripture outranks everybody and Starbucks outranks me. Hold on. Mm. Cheers, everybody. Okay. By the way, God's word does not cover everything. It doesn't cover every issue. And it doesn't have to because now we go to the third level of authority called your conscience. Now watch this. This is the most liberating thing I ever heard in my life. And I say, why wasn't that preached? Okay, so the authority of the conscience. Listen to Romans 2 verse 14. For when pagans who do not have the law or God's word uh, do things contained in the law, they show the law written on their heart. The conscience, their conscience speaks to them. Their thoughts either accuse or excuse them. So Paul is establishing the authority of the conscience in a life of the human race and specifically the life of a believer. He says that God will judge a pagan by his response to his conscience. The conscience is God's word written on our hearts and minds. So, uh, this is off the track a little bit, but people always want to know, what about people who have never heard? God gave them a conscience, all right? And uh, by, by virtue, you know what you don't want others to do to you. I don't have to be a Christian. I know what I don't want. I don't want you to lie to me. I don't want you to rob me. I don't want you to kill me. I, I, those, by virtue of that fact, then I know what I should not do. My conscience, even as a pagan, is telling me that's wrong. When, a little, when one of your little toddlers, you know, steals the cookie or takes something and stands like this, they weren't taught God's word, but they knew they did something wrong. It, it, it's, it, that's part of the conscience, okay? So everybody with normal brain function has a conscience, all right, now, this is the fun part. Uh, Romans 13 said, Every soul be subject to the higher authority. So in Romans chapter 14, verse 5 and 6 and verse 13, I'm not going to read those right now, Paul is addressing problems of the conscience in the early church. Remember, he's taking Hebrews, Jewish people, under the Mosaic law, he's taking them out of that into a new covenant reality with Jesus. And they're under days and smells and bells and, and Sabbaths. They're under all that. Uh, eat this, touch that, don't touch that, don't eat this, eat this. It was prohibited. It was awful, just terrible. So they've, they've got that ingrained in them, although he's preached being born of the Spirit by no work of the law, and it's new. 
Then some of the other guys are coming behind Paul and putting them back under Mosaic law, okay? So they're having a problem about food, about wine, about Sabbath days, all being disturbed by these false apostles. So Paul says, where scripture is silent or unclear, rule by your conscience. In other words, uh, he says, if you violate your conscience in Romans 14, to you only it is sin. Only judge not your brother. So whatever is not of faith is sin. Now, if it's clearly in Scripture, my conscience has no part. It has no authority. If Scripture is clear and I say something, well, it doesn't bother my conscience, well, submit to the higher authority. The Word of God rules over my conscience. But where Scripture isn't clear or it's silent, You rule, you make a right, wrong decision by your conscience. Now, that is liberating. But preachers will preach their conscience on you as law. You cannot do that. Or you will do that to other people and judge other people. And clear scripture in Romans 14 says, do not judge your brother. Okay, so clear scripture overrules your conscience. If something is clearly prohibited by scripture, but it doesn't bother your conscience, it's still wrong. Right. Now, where is scripture not clear? Let's say I want to choose the sex of my child, because now you can. Oh, I just think, well, first of all, that's the problem here because you don't have scripture. Well, I just believe you don't have scripture. Those are tip-offs that somebody is, is offended in their conscience or they themselves couldn't imagine themselves doing that. Then to you only it is sin. Only judge not your brother. I could have, there is no immorality. There's no violation of scripture on choosing the sex of your child. I'll eat the page. Find it. It's not in the Bible. Now, I'm pushing you. I'm, gonna, I'm using extreme examples on purpose to make you think, okay? People Magazine, many years ago, had an article on the front page of a woman who couldn't have a baby. She had, she had no womb. She had eggs. The husband had seed, but she could not have a baby. So the doctors took his seed, her egg, implanted the seed in the egg, and her mother, who was healthy and young, said, I'll incubate the baby. I'll, I'll be the garage for the baby. <laughs> so that's a surrogate mom, yes. right? Yeah. Okay. The Roman Catholic Church, unless they've changed, you have to help me, outlawed surrogate motherhood as a sin. So I said to a, a priest, it's a friend, I said, well, that's going to sort of contradict what the Virgin Mary did, isn't it? (laughs) And you know what he said to me? He said, I never thought about it. I says, the churches do not teach you how to think. They just teach you facts that may or may not be right or wrong. I want to know why you came to that conclusion. Give me scripture for that. So being a surrogate mom is not a sin. It's just a choice you make, and everybody wouldn't do it, doesn't want to do it, couldn't do it. So to you only, it would be sin. But do not judge someone else who does, right? Isn't that liberating? Okay. Uh, I can remember uh, music. Well, I just believe that's the devil's beat. I just believe that's the devil's music. Okay, I've heard you. Now give me scripture on what makes the devil's beat. What is the devil's beat? Three, four beat, four, four beat. What, what, would be, what would be the devil's beat? I've heard this for years. There's no scripture on the beat of a song. All the psalms written by David are written musically. And David was a harpist. He could play a musical instrument. I don't know what beat he used. It doesn't say. So stop making a rule when scripture is silent or unclear. Well, I don't like those smoke machines, and I don't like the high tech. Give me scripture. If you don't like it, leave. But there's no sin, (laughs) right? There's no sin. 
I'm trying to help you make a proper assessment so you just don't be a jackass to people by making statements that are so false and wrong. So it does, that we don't know. Can I use a drum? Can I use, you can let everything praise God. Anything can. The only thing that I'm aware of is that God says, don't use profane uh, lyrics. Okay, but about beat and styles of music, they've been forever changing because God put no boundary on it at all. So don't you put a boundary on it. Just say my preference is this. Personally, me, I like that old-time rock and roll, the kind of music that thrills your soul. I don't, I don't want none of that disco. I just like old-time rock and roll. I think country music damages brain cells, so I don't like it. I don't. I'm kidding. I'm only kidding. All right, it's time for a drink. <laughs> sex, sex in marriage. I've had guys preach seminars on family. You can't do this. You shouldn't do that. It's wrong to do this. I said, give me scripture on it. In the New Testament, there are only two scriptures regarding sexual contact with married people. In Hebrews 13, marriage is honorable in all, A-L-L, -L, all, and the bed undefiled. And then the other one would be about fasting in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's 7, chapter 7, in which you go to way fast, and it says, then come back together, lest Satan tempt you. So, in other words, your body's not yours, your wife's body's not hers. Uh, it's, it's mutual submission to each other, and that's it. God leaves that free. You want to put a water slide in your bedroom? Have a good time. <laughs> you can do anything you want. And I, I mean, there are guys that teach some of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my life. Okay, I, I'm not get, trying to be rude in any way, but I think that's enough to let you realize there's nothing prohibited between two married people. Nothing. Whatever is mutually pleasing and appropriate for you, don't judge your brother. Right? Okay. Okay. Now, if we were all guys, I could be very explicit. But... <laughs> I'm trying to get you to think. I think that's enough for you to realize. There is no prohibition on any kind of style on it. Can I cut grass on Sunday? You can plow on Sunday. Of course you can. We're not under any Mosaic law. And if you read Scripture in Romans, he says, One man observes one day, uh, another man observes another day. Let every man be fully persuaded. You can worship God on Wednesday. You can worship God on Saturday. You, you can't be justified by a day. You're justified by Christ. But you can worship any day. Every day's holy day now. We don't have a Sabbath. We're under no Sabbath today. I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist. It shouldn't be. I'm not under any food laws. Some foods are healthy and not healthy, but there are no food laws that make you unrighteous. They clog your arteries. They may cause you to die uh, prematurely, but it is not unholy. You can eat pork. You can eat bacon. You couldn't under the Mosaic Law, but all things are to be received, Paul says, and nothing rejected, for it is sanctified by, by prayer and thanksgiving. That's why we say the blessing. So I can eat bacon, but if I eat too much, it's not good for me. But it doesn't hurt my righteousness. It is up to you to use wisdom on that, okay? So those are three levels that are above man. Sovereign authority, voracious authority, the authority of the truth, the word of God, and the authority of the conscience. So conscience only has authority when, when Scripture silent or unclear. Now, isn't God clever? Because we couldn't have books to contain every issue that would ever come up. Every certain God says, I'll throw in this one. After my word, I'll throw in the conscience. Leave each other alone. I like that. I, I've never heard that preached in my life anywhere. I'm a graduate of two colleges. I'm also a graduate of seminary, and I've never heard it ever in my whole upbringing. It would have been liberating to people to have known that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody want to say something to me about conscience, uh, or we could do it in the question and answers. Okay. Now, number four, here's another one that you'll remember. Delegated authority. Delegated authority. This is the first level any man or woman has any right to. The first one. No man is in those first three. Nobody. Nobody. Oh, by the way, if somebody wants you to violate your conscience, you don't have to. You're not in rebellion if you, dis, if you 
do not wish to uh, violate your conscience, but you might have a price to pay. Okay, uh, we, we could mention that uh, Daniel refused to obey the king's edict. He went to a lion's den. Uh, Paul, uh, Peter refused to stop preaching Jesus, was beaten and put in jail. So there, there may be a price to pay, so you want to make sure you want to pay that price before you say, that bothers my conscience. Well, be sure it's not a major issue. That, that's just common sense. But you have a right to do it. If your husband asks you to do something uh, that violates your conscience, you have a right, it, unless there's clear scripture, you have a right to say, honey, I can't do that. Now, you're not in rebellion, okay? You're, because a husband cannot, as a human being, override your conscience. Unless there's clear scripture. Maybe in sexual activity or something, a wife, because of her background, says, no, I can't do that. I love you. I'm, I'm happy with you physically, but no, no, I can't do that. Okay, she doesn't have to. She's not in rebellion against uh, God or you. She is clearly obeying her conscience. So no husband, no authority can make you do something against your conscience. Okay, so now delegated authority. Ephesians 4, verse 11 I'm sorry, Hebrews 13, forgive me. Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey your spiritual leaders and do as they say. Their work, by the way, do as they say, as long as it doesn't violate God's word, Amen. your conscience, the law, or morality. I mean, obviously, okay, there's a limit there, but do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls, and they know they're accountable to God. So no man has the right to violate your conscience, to violate scripture, or to claim sovereign authority over you. Authority never extends beyond responsibility. If you want authority, all you have to do is take responsibility. If a husband wants authority in the home, you marry, you produce children, and if you take responsibility for your wife and children, you get authority. However, if you don't come home, you won't pay the bills, you're unfaithful, you will not be responsible, you now have forfeited authority over the wife. You do not have authority over her at all. I don't have authority over my neighbor's wife because I don't have any responsibility for her. I don't have authority over my neighbor's children. I don't have any responsibility for them. Uh, if, if Chad... And uh, Julie left their kids with Cindy and I for an overnight travel. They're going to go somewhere. I am being delegated a measure of responsibility and authority because I am accepting them and the responsibility to make sure they're in bed on time, get their bath, what they watch on TV, if they have to take some medicine. They, as the higher authority as their parents, because they're totally responsible for those children. I'm not, but I am for the night. So under their authority, those kids have, I've taken responsibility, so I have a measure of authority over those kids. That authority ends as soon as Chad picks them up. As soon as those kids are picked up, now I have no authority because now I have no responsibility. Uh, if I go to a church and it's a young pastor and I'm not young and he's inexperienced but he started the church and I'm invited in, who has the highest authority? Not me. I don't have any responsibility for that church. I, he has the higher authority. Authority. He may not have the higher education. He may not have the highest level of anointing. He may not have the highest skills about a lot of things, but he's responsible for that whole church. Therefore, he outranks me. I don't have any responsibility. I only have authority in this church for this session standing up here that's been delegated to me by Chad. Right. See? And that ends the moment I step down. Yeah. That's it. And if he wanted to interrupt or overrule me, he could because he's the higher authority. Yeah. That makes sense? Uh, okay, so if you don't have responsibility, you don't have any authority. Now, here is a nasty. Where did we ever get church votes? Where did we ever get business meetings and church votes with people? Unsaved people, saved people, carnal people, uh, spiritual people, an equal vote. I'll eat the page of the Bible. 
You will not find that in the Old Testament. You will not find that in the New Testament. Moses chose 70 elders whom he knew, God told him to, and God says, now you let them handle small matters, you handle the big matter. In other words, he delegated a, a responsibility to the elders, some over a thousand, some a hundred, some fifty, and some ten. He gave them delegated a measure of responsibility, therefore they had a measure of authority, but he got the big problems because he is the highest authority, he's responsible for all of Israel right? So nobody outranks him. Okay. So, uh, I have an elder board. That's Bible. We don't have a congregational vote. We elders vote together. We seek mutual agreement on subjects, on discipline, on anything. And if we can't come to an agreement, but an, a decision has to be made, I have to make it, but I am responsible for it too. See, so it's not majority vote. In Acts 15, when the Gentiles were getting saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, there was an uproar. Well, they're not Jewish. They can't have what we have. And so they got to come under the Mosaic law. And they said, absolutely not. So the apostles and elders held a meeting, no church vote, and they argued about it. And each one presented their case. And at the end, James, who is the set man, the senior pastor of the Jerusalem church, he got up and says, okay, here's what we will decree. You know, don't eat anything strangled with blood, avoid fornication and idolatry. And that was pretty much it. We pagans were on our own, but he made the final call because he had the highest authority. So can you just imagine giving your children an equal vote? See, you want it in the church, but you won't allow it at home. See, it, that's called tyranny. No, 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 no. So my elders can overrule me in three or four areas. If I'm illegal, if I'm unbiblical, if I'm immoral. Now, I am subject to dismissal or censorship or rebuke. Other than that, if you don't like me, don't serve, quit, leave, but don't challenge authority. So if I went to that young guy's church and I didn't like what he's doing at all because I have no authority, having no responsibility, I have a choice to leave or submit, but not rebel or lead any sort of opposition because now I'm in rebellion yeah. against God. So remember, this is talking to the church. This is how we operate. So I, I feel sorry for a great uh, leaders who are subject to these votes by people who are mixed in, who some aren't even saved, some are carnal, so, some have ungodly alliances, and you're going to give them an equal vote, and you're going to have chaos. You're never going to get the will of God in there. So you won't find it in the New Testament. You won't find it. Why, for example, why wouldn't I let Summit Church, why would I not let them have authority? Well, because your name's not on the banknote. Mine is. <laughs> and if we get sued, you aren't on the lawsuit. I am. Yeah. You, want, you want the same responsibility that I have? And I thought, fine, then you co-sign. Yeah. Yeah. You co you're, not, you're not under any obligation. Therefore, be quiet or leave because you have no responsibility. You have no authority. A senior pastor cannot be usurped by an elder board at all. They can have an opinion. They could state how they feel, certainly, respectfully. But beyond that, the senior guy makes his call. That's his prerogative. Moses, you make the final call. You take the hard choices yourself. Does that make sense? Okay. Gosh, that could solve a lot of problems. So uh, let me see if I can get out of that and move on here. So I have delegated authority. That's, that's about it. Now, let me give you a couple examples. Airport security. Uh, remove your shoes. Remove your belt. Take off your jacket. Now, the agent telling me that might not even have a high school diploma. Okay, I'm just saying this. But he's operating in delegated authority by Homeland Security. So you will obey whether you're a CEO, a Ph.D., or you're an apostle, you will submit because Homeland Security has delegated authority to him to let me in or reject me. So I obey or I get arrested. He's the higher authority in an airport, not to church, 
but in the airport. It's authority. If I get on the plane, the flight attendant is responsible for the safety of all the passengers. If she asked you to do something, you say, yes, ma'am. Or you'll be removed from the plane or arrested when you land and put on a no-fly zone. See, that's delegated authority. Uh, let me think of something else. Uh, there's so many. I just want to get you to thinking, you know. Uh, if a, if a president comes into our service, I had a governor come to our service and come back and meet with me. Not somebody I voted for, but I honored his office. Maybe I don't like him or his ideology or policy, but I honor the office. If you've been in the military, you salute that uniform, a higher authority. And yes, sir. And the guy may be a womanizer, an adulterer. He may be a lousy character, but you're submitting to a higher authority. But remember, you, if I'm commanded to do something that violates Scripture, I don't have to obey delegated authority. So Daniel said, no, no, I'm going to pray. Uh, number two, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says, no, we won't bow to an idol. Uh, Peter said, no, you told me I cannot preach Jesus. No, we'll preach Jesus. That was a clear command of Scripture, and they got beaten and put in prison. So you can rebel against a false, wrong, delegated authority's edict, but there may be a price to pay. Okay, we mentioned conscience. We live in the vaccine, no vaccine. Churches are all split up on it. Everybody has their own opinion. Since we don't have scripture for a vaccine, it's your conscience. But don't judge your brother. You anti, shut up. You pro, you shut up. If you want your vaccine, get your vaccine. If you don't, you don't have to violate your conscience, but you might lose your job. You might be prohibited from entry in certain activities. So be sure you're prepared for that, but you have not dishonored God. You're not unrighteous. I can rebel against delegated authority, but there will be a penalty. And many were burned at the stake or put in prison or tortured or hurt in some way because they did. But it was righteous. So bear in mind, delegated authority is not sovereign authority. So if the president issues an edict, I don't have to obey one that, that violates my conscience. I don't have to obey that. But there may be civil penalties I have to pay. Does that make sense? But I'm not unrighteous. Okay. Uh, let's close this. Stipulative authority is number five. This is simple. Stipulative authority are the terms and conditions of a legal contract or an agreement. I will pay you this much on the fifth of each month for 36 payments. That's an authority because you signed a contract to do so, right? Yeah. Okay, stipulative authority, all right? Number six, authority of custom and tradition. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 16 says, But if anyone wants to argue about this, all I can say is we have no other custom than this, and all of the churches of God feel the same way about it. So custom is validated as having a limited place of authority. So if Cindy and I go to a church and they said, we prefer that women wear hats in here. Well, I know automatically you don't have to wear a hat. Uh, but, but I could say, okay, I can live with that. It's a custom in that church. If I'm in Asia, take off your shoes. Okay. I know taking off my shoes, not shoes in the New Testament is not mandated by scripture. But if I want to preach the gospel, those are not going to hurt me in any way. I'm not violating scripture in any way. So I submit to the custom of that church, how they run the service. That's a custom. That's a tradition. It's not illegal. It's not evil. If you don't like it, don't go. But otherwise, it has limited authority as long as it doesn't violate higher authority, Scripture, or your conscience, okay? And then there's last, functional authority, functional authority. Those are abilities or gifts you have by birth or by training or by impartation. So let me give you an example. We go to an accident. We hear a terrible crash outside the church. We rush out. And let's say there's an apostle, and there is a, a uh, policeman, and there's a mechanic, and there's a physician. And all of us are looking at the wreck. Okay, so we come onto this wreck. Who do I want to attend to the physically injured person? I don't want the mechanic. I want the doctor. Why? why? He's skilled in his ability to treat the physically injured. 
So he outranks the rest of us by his ability, his functional ability. Uh, who, who writes the citation for if it was drunk driving or somebody did something wrong? The policeman. That's his authority delegated by the city or the state, and uh, he's trained to do that. He gives the citations, not the, not the doctor, not the apostle, not the mechanic. Who moves the wrecked cars? The mechanic. That's his, that's his job. He's got a functional ability. In it. The only guy with no authority at the wreck scene is the apostle. He can just stand back and pray, but he doesn't have, he doesn't have anything that will solve that problem in his training or ability. Unless there's a funeral. Yeah, unless there's a funeral, and probably will be. So here's one. Let's say I get on Delta tomorrow, I mean Monday, to go home, and the two pilots are incapacitated, and the flight attendant says, is there a pilot on the plane? Okay, let's say a guy, I am a commercial pilot, by the way. Let's say there is one guy on there who flies a little Cessna 150. He's had a little bit of training. He has a private pilot's license. He's the highest authority on that airplane at that moment because of functional authority. He at least knows up and down, left and right. He at least could receive from the, from the ground control instructions. And it may be a mess and it may be a crash, but he's the only hope we've got because of his functional training. Okay, let's say there's two of us. Let's say there's a guy with a, a, a private pilot's license and there is a military pilot with uh, a 1,000 hours in jets. Who outranks who? He does. He outranks the guy that flew a 150 in a private. He's higher skilled. Right. So he would be the guy telling you what to do suddenly. See, functional authority. In a marriage, in Ephesians, it says mutually submit to one another. Wives, submit yourself to your husband. And then he goes on to say uh, submit to one another in the fear of God. That's Ephesians 5, verse 21. So that simply means mutual submission in marriage. My wife or your wife might be better at handling money or the finances than let her by function. You're the head of the home, but you're delegating that because of mutual submission. My, I don't, some men cook. I don't cook. I couldn't burn anything. I don't cook. So Cindy's got the authority to say, here's what we're having tonight. Here's when we're having it. You like it or leave one or the other. I say, yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank you, honey. That's it. That's a functional authority. If I was married to uh, uh, Danica Patrick, she's a NASCAR driver. If the car had something wrong, I'd let, Dan I'd let Dana go fix it. You go check it out and see what's wrong. By her training, I don't feel threatened. If somebody in the marriage or in the relationship is better by function, let them have it because it's to your good. If you base a marriage on submission only and not love as the foundation, you won't go very far. Not, not, it's not going to work. So it's mutual submission in that allowing it. Uh, this is something, Chad, you'll get. Because I am the pastor, the founder, the senior pastor, then somebody says, I want you to pray for me. Well, wait a minute. There are people gifted better in some areas for prayer than me. There are certain things I pray for that I get a reasonable good return on. There are others who get a better return on something else. Maybe it's a physical illness. I, I've had an opportunity to pray for barren women for 40 years, and I've, I've been amazed at the, at the uh, results. have been very substantial. I don't know why. That just, it just works all the time. So I would be, I would be a good one to pray for that. And let's say somebody else has a better gift in praying for certain sicknesses. Wouldn't you want them to pray for you? Oh, I want the pastor to pray. Look, if I pray for you, you might die. <laughs> Don't you want somebody that's got at least a high average of, of doing well in it? But Christians are so dumb. Me being a senior pastor doesn't mean I'm the best at everything. I, I mean, I, I, huh? Yeah, I'm not a good counselor because I'm too direct and to the point, you know. But there are people that have lots of tissue, lots of patience, and will just let you drone on and on and cry. I just stay away from it. I just, I'm not good at that. I want to give you to somebody 
who understands, who is a very good counselor, and I know that's not, that's not my gift. Yeah, I pray for you, but I'm, I'm saying, I'm trying to show, make you think that we're not all good in everything. We're all good in something, and you'd want that something to be what prayed for you. So it's not the senior pastor doesn't guarantee you everything's going to be okay. You're going to live and not die. That's not true. So you want somebody. So I delegate my weakness. I soar with my strength. We've got financial advisors as to do the spreadsheets and accounting. I hate that. I don't want nothing. You just tell me we're up, we're down. How much do we need? You tell me that, and I'll go get it. But I don't care about running those numbers, but we have guys who do. I, I'm not an intercessor. I pray. I pray all the time. But I, I've had people say, well, Brother Rick, would you put me on your prayer list when I'm leaving the church somewhere? I said, look, if you can find the list, you can get on it. I, I don't have any list. What are you talking? Nonsense? I said, I'm going to pray for you right now, this moment, because when I walk out that door, I'm going to have a Diet Coke, and I won't even think about you again. Now, why don't preachers say that? They're not, I'm going to carry you I don't even know. Are you mad? Put me on your prayer list. I have no relationship with you. Nothing. So I'm just telling you the honest to God truth. So I'm going to pray for you right now, my son. I pray right now. It's anointed, and I'm going to pray. But I ain't got a prayer list for you to get on. Some of this stuff that I went to one church and they said, now, Pastor, we're going to leave you alone in here for the next year so you can seek God and, and give you some quiet time. I said, you just flew me 7,000 miles. You paid for my ticket. You paid for the hotel. If I'm not ready, you're in deep yogurt, right? <laughs> I'm ready. I don't need my quiet time uh, at this point. Well, that's religious stuff, religious stuff. In season, out of season. I, I, that, you hear what I'm saying? Okay. How's the clock? Are we out? Yeah, we're good. We're done? No, I just, as something comes to my mind, oh, I see, I got four minutes, 26 seconds. Okay. Does that ring some of this? Conscience ought to really ring your bell. Scripture silent or unclear conscience. Okay. Uh, remember, first of all, is it scriptural? If not, go to conscience. Okay. And then number two, delegated authority. I only have authority where I have responsibility. So if I delegate to one of my elders, home groups, that's his only area of authority because that's the responsibility I've given him. He cannot prance over to my worship team and tell my worship leader what to do or what to sing or how loud or how soft it has to be. Why? He's out of order. He has not been given responsibility for that area. Therefore, he has no authority. How simple this would be and getting along with people. So the key is always who's got the highest authority. And if authority tells me to do something unscriptural or violates my conscience, I have a right to say no. I hope it's respectful. I hope it's courteous. Paul got into a, a deal where he was cussing the high priest, but he didn't know Ananias was the high priest. And as a result of his slashing out at a guy he ab abhorred, the guy standing by says, slapped him and he says do you not know you are speaking to the high priest and Paul the apostle who wrote 75 percent of your new testament said oh I didn't know he was the high priest for it is written thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people he repented he didn't like the guy but he repented of what he was doing and his outburst against it you see so as soon as he found out that was a higher authority he honored that office but not the man Okay, you don't have to agree with me or Chad to be respectful. And if you think we're abhorrent, you go somewhere else for crying out loud. You got two feet. This, nope. I don't get how people, but don't give up a good relationship and good people in a good place because you disagree with one, one thing. One, that's, you'll never stay married if that's the issue. You won't stay employed if that's the issue. There's no perfect anything except God's word and our Lord. There's nothing else perfect, and thank God for the cross. So I'm not under food laws. I'm not under dietary laws. I'm not under Sabbath day laws. I'm not under anything but clear scripture from God's word. Now, I'm going to stop. That's pretty simple. 
Does that ring any bell with anybody uh, that you want to hit me with before we take our break? I, I, I mean, honestly, I, I can take any question. So why don't we allow them to write these questions down? Okay. I think there are a lot of people percolating on everything you just said. Why don't everybody, you've got your card right now, write down anything you may want him to touch base on. We're going to have a 25-minute coffee break right now and uh, give your cards to uh, the host team. Mandy's over there. I think there's some drop baskets in the back. The Generation Center has coffee and light refreshments. Can we give a huge hand to Pastor Rick for what Thank he just you guys. did? Thank you, guys. And uh, what I will tell you is very, very rarely do I ever ask someone to speak a specific thing. I was in Nashville four years ago with Pastor Rick, and he spoke this message, and I put in a prescription for this message for this morning. And how many think it was worthwhile? Awesome, awesome. Hey, go enjoy some coffee, write down some questions, and we'll be back in 25 minutes. Let's put a 25-minute clock up. Thanks. Thanks.